Welcome to Indie Unplugged, the podcast that's your front row seat to the real talk of Indianola. I'm Aaron Young, your friendly neighborhood host, and we're diving deep into unfiltered stories, candid chats, and the nitty gritty of our vibrant city. Think of this as a crash course in all things Indianola. No fancy jargon, just real conversations. So get comfy, hit that play button, and let's explore the heart and soul of our community together on Indie Unplugged. All right, we are back for another episode of Indie Unplugged, the City of Indianola podcast, and we are going to have a great conversation today with two of our leaders from the Community Development Department, Charlie DeSell and Emily Rizvich. Charlie, let's just start off with, when we went through our restructure, you have probably one of the coolest titles now, and when I say coolest, I mean in the sense of Every time I put it in a communication or if I'm updating a document or doing anything digitally, I always do different versions of what your title actually is. So why don't we just start off with what your new role is for the city and just your story. My position since I've been here, it's always been one of those things where if you have a character limit when you're entering it in, it's always been really tough because it previously was community and economic development director. Um, It is now deputy city manager slash chief of development and operations. Um, So previously it was just in charge of the community development department, which obviously includes Emily, um, our building official code enforcement officer. Um, But now it is stretched to be in charge of community development and also the public works function. So I'm essentially the go between the city manager and our uh, department leaders in both the wastewater treatment uh, facility uh, department there and the public works department, so streets department. Um, AP is in charge of those two functions there and reports up to me, and and I just make sure I'm that go-between that department and the city manager. And then, Emily, how about you? Tell us a little bit more about your role and kind of your involvement with the city. Yeah, so I'm the associate planner for the city. So a lot of what I do is application intake for site development, subdivisions of land, um, all of that, um, and then just making sure that all those applications are fully submitted and then taking them from staff review um, through the development review team and then taking them to the planning and zoning and presenting those cases and staff's recommendation. Um, And then Charlie takes it on from there to city council. A couple of weeks ago, both of you presented the 2023 annual report for the Community Development Department. What a great year Indianola had in 2023 with so many things that uh, we collectively were able to accomplish, as well as so many things in motion as we look for uh, 2024 and the months and years ahead. Um, just tell us a little bit more about the highlights of how far Indianola has come in 2023 and what the future looks like for the city. I think overall the year, it started out a little bit slower than what I have been used to in the five years that I've been here. Um, And really up until right about the end of summer was trending to be somewhat of a down year. Um, Towards the end of the year, that last quarter of 2023, we had a lot of development proposals that started trickling in. Um, which really kind of helped. And then we had a lot of uh, homes being built as well on top of that, which was able to get our number back up to where we're kind of more comfortable with. On the building permit side of things, you know, our total number of permits have traditionally been trending down over the last couple of years. That's not necessarily a surprise, um, just with, you know, where the economy has been, where the interest rates have been for people who are developing within the community. Uh, But the one thing we really like is when that total valuation of those projects that are coming in uh, is trending up. So we have continued to see that number trend up over the five years that I've been here. Um, and I think last year we just went north of 40 million in total valuation on projects that are coming in. Um, in comparison to some of our other peers in the metro, that number might not seem as high, but for Indianola, um, that number is pretty high. So that's been good. When we look at code enforcement, for example, that's a big thing that we handle. Um, I think our numbers in 2023 were similar to where they were in 2022 as far as code cases that we had started. Uh, I think our big one is always tall grass and weeds, and we're getting into that time of year where that becomes a thing. Um, but uh, that was similar to what, what it was last year. I think the one difference we saw last year, 
as opposed to previous years was the total number of sheer complaints we were getting in. So our total number of complaints, they nearly doubled, maybe tripled um, from 2022 to 2023. Wow. Um, one thing that we deal with from time to time is we will have one code enforcement case that we handle, um, and the person who we are handling that with will uh, take some liberties to then turn in everybody else who is doing the same exact thing uh, within the city, and sometimes that draws our numbers up. So we are complaint-based. We don't actively necessarily go out and look for violations. Uh, we will do that occasionally on some of our higher travel corridors, especially on the two highways in town. Uh, we try to keep track of those and maybe be a little bit more proactive in those areas. Uh, but we're not driving through neighborhoods day in and day out looking for violations. We're really relying on the citizens of the community to give us that information, and then we'll go out and verify it. Um, so I say that again. We we really started dealing with a a few of those complaints that we had that then would what we call kind of retaliatory complaints coming in and uh, just a few of them that had a sheer number of hundreds that they were submitting. Um, thankfully, I have a really good staff. Emily uh, is no exception to that. And we are able to then go and look through each one of those cases uh, that gets put in and verify them. And um, a lot of times they're not valid complaints that we're getting in. So we're closing those out. But um, we just did have a pretty heavy number of those here back in 2023. And then looking at rentals, um, that's something that we just uh, had a rental code that was adopted in 2021. It was at the end of 2020, early 2021, I believe. And um, really, we had to do that because state code mandated that we did it. Um, state code says when you surpass a population of 15,000, that you have to have a rental inspection program within your city. Um, and in 2010, I think the census, we were just under that. I think we were just around 14,800 in 2010. And then in 2020, we got to 15,900. So at that point, we had to do a rental inspection program. We went through the whole process of doing that. Um, and we are just now um, going to the tail end of the first two year cycle of that rental inspection program. So we have, what is it, 2,200 rentals roughly in the city of Indianola. And um, we are doing our process over this last year and a half. And uh, the first cycle will be over within June 30th of this year. Um, but inspecting all of those uh, rental units within the city and assuring um, just that the basic life safety measures of those units are being um, realized. Of those 2,200 of those rental properties and knowing that right now we're still in the middle of approaching the wards two and four for their deadlines of that 2,200, Percentage-wise, for where we're at right now, for those who have uh, properly registered, who are following the process, is the community doing their part to ensure that they're meeting the deadlines? Or what's kind of that status update that you can uh, you can provide? Mostly, yes. Um, I've actually been very pleasantly surprised at the compliance that we're getting on this. Um, it seems when we... So we broke it down. Um, the first eight-month cycle that we had was Ward 1. And then the second one was Ward 3, and then the third one was Wards 2 and 4. Mm -hmm. The first one, I think we had to adjudicate one or two of them in total, and then we're in the same one uh, in, in Ward uh, 3 right now is just adjudicating a couple of those uh, properties that are out there. So, again, when you're dealing with 2,200 properties and in end we might have to adjudicate five to ten of them in total, I, I think that's a really good success rate. What about some of the other highlights from 2023 in terms of what you've compiled in that annual report? I mean, there was just so many pages of just so many, you know, X's that were marked off or things that are ongoing that, you know, Indianola is on the cusp for so many new and emerging opportunities the the only thing i you know one other thing i think i want to really look at is our comprehensive plan so our comprehensive plan was adopted in may of 2020 um and we've tried to kind of keep up on some of the implementation measures that were in that comprehensive plan in total we had 162 implementation measures within that comprehensive plan um, we were able to report in, at the end of 2023 that we had started at least some process of implementing at least half of those uh, at this point in time. So in four years, we've gotten about 80, I think, that we have started implementation on. 
I mean, that's really good. I mean, we comprehensive plans typically look out 20 years or so. So if we're able to get half of those done in the first four years, that's pretty good. Um, I think some of the outstanding ones that we still have left to do are bigger ones that are going to take a lot of time to get done and a lot of resources to get done. Uh, but still, I think our staff has done a really, really good job of making sure we are ensuring that the community's vision um, from 2020 is being realized. Uh, going back to 2020, we had a great deal of public engagement, and thankfully we got most of it in uh, before the COVID pandemic hit. So, um, you know, we talked survey responses, and that one in particular, we had nearly 1,500 survey responses on that comprehensive plan process. So we really did get a good snapshot of what the community wants to see Indianola as in the future. So again, by following that implementation plan, we are making sure that the community's vision is being realized. Has that vision shifted at all? I mean, you talk about kind of getting those responses pre-COVID and then now, you know, even though COVID's still around, I'm going to say post-COVID, but just uh, post-pandemic, how do you... uh, kind of navigate any shifting priorities that come from the community and those demands or those um, those visions that they want to see this, the city uh, take advantage of. And it's, it's an evolving plan. It's always going to be an evolving plan. And it's one of those things, if you aren't looking at it constantly and you aren't making little changes here and there, um, you know, you're not keeping up with the times. And, and we've done that, you know, some of the, the development plans that we've had out there have required comprehensive plan amendments. That's been good. Uh, we continue at the staff level to look at some of our growth areas and make sure that uh, what was visioned in 2020 still makes sense uh, for the future. Um, you know, as far as the pandemic and how that uh, really um, related to things, you know, for Indianola, I don't, I don't want to say it's a bedroom community necessarily, but when you look at that term somewhat, that does apply to Indianola. Uh, knowing that, I think if anything, um, we've maybe just seen a daytime population uh, increase from where it was in 2020 with a lot of people working from home. Uh, but when we look at the comprehensive plan, and, and one thing that Indianola really should be proud of is our fiber utility that Indianola Municipal Utilities has. Um, and it's it's an awesome utility. It's a great thing that we can um, put out there and, and show people who are moving to the community that we have it. And that has only helped us, I think, through that and making sure people do have the ability to work from home if that is what their job is uh, requiring them to do. With utilities and infrastructure, there could be that perception for those who are not from Indianola that Indianola is an aging community in terms of its uh, population, in terms of its infrastructure. But it seems like and I, when I glean from the annual report and being a new employee to the city now five, six months in, that's totally far from the truth. Like we are on the up and up of ensuring that while there are things that are outdated, we are updating things for the sense of uh, being able to provide that that quality of life and be able to um, provide optimal services for residents, for visitors, for businesses to um, thrive in their daily life that's that's an accurate statement right oh yeah yeah definitely we I I think we've done a really good job of making sure that our infrastructure is being updated and there's a plan out there to update some of our older infrastructure Um, all you have to do is walk outside and take a walk around the square to realize that um, you know our square when you know I go back to five years ago when when I started here Um, at the time, the city manager, Ryan Waller, uh, even before I had started was sending me information, um, on, uh, Hey, the Warren County justice center is going to be changing. We need to be taking a look at what we do in our square. So even before I started here, I was starting to kind of review some RFPs that we had to do a planning process on a master plan for the downtown square. Um, I bring that up just because I have been working on that ever since I have been here, and today it continues. Um, But through that process, you know, we were looking at what can we do to create better pedestrian amenities around our square to complement the new courthouse that was coming. Um, And it was realized through that process that, hey, guys, we need to take a look at our infrastructure. We have sewer lines in the ground that are 120 years old in some spaces, water lines that were 120 year old in some places. Um, We had water lines that were uh, undersized. I mean, at the time they were put in, four inch water mains made a lot of sense um, in modern day era when we have to deal with fire suppression systems and things like that. 
um, it doesn't make much sense anymore. So we had to take a look at a lot of that stuff and make sure that um, when we were updating our square, if we were going to be putting new roads, new sidewalks and stuff in, well, hey, when that lid is off the ground, let's take a look at the infrastructure that's in the ground in that project went from, you know, initially a four and a half million dollar project to nearly a $10 million project because we knew we needed to take care of that infrastructure uh, in the square. And, and the square is obviously the heartbeat of our community. Um, and it was a good investment. And, you know, it took a little bit of time to get it done. We're still working on it now. Uh, but, um, you know, I think moving forward for the future, um, it's going to pay off immensely. And what are those conversations like with community members in terms of when you talked about, you know, that project going from $4 million to $10 million? Again, I wasn't here um, to even be part of the, the conversations and, and have a, an understanding of what the dialogue was like. But I feel like probably from the sense of a lot of our community, they're probably, you know, I that's more that I have to pay. What just yeah. what was it like for you and for community development to kind of navigate those discussions? Gosh, it was it was something else because timing was everything on this one, too. So. Um, you know, I think once we started looking at things and we started realizing the infrastructure component to that project, it started making a lot of sense and people kind of bought in and said, yeah, you know, now's the time to do this because we don't want to be coming back in 10 years and doing this again. Uh, we knew that we were going to have a pretty big disruption on the square between the Justice Center and between the downtown project um, for about a four year period. And we were able to sell that, especially to the stakeholders in the downtown um, just, you know, it's going to be one of those things where we're going to have a little bit of painful time here, um, but we'll get through it. And, and uh, that they bought in on that portion of it. Um, but then COVID happened and then we saw rising infrastructure costs, uh, pricings and all of that stuff. And that's where it really started accelerating into a bigger project. You know, if that project, if we would have started two years sooner, for example, um, that project probably is 25 percent cheaper. Uh, something like that, I would say. It's just it, it was the time that it got bid out and, and how much it ended up costing. But, um, you know, in the end, it was it was a great experience because we got the single bid back for the project. You know, we would have hoped that we would have gotten more bids on that. Um, but it is what it is. We had one single bid on it. And, you know, I, I from my standpoint, um, I don't remember the date that we opened the bid, but it was midweek and we were taking to council the next Monday and there was a good three to four day period where I really questioned if the project was even going to happen because I didn't know what we were going to do to make up these costs. And it was, since I've been here in five years, maybe one of the low points in my career, just because it's one of those gut wrenching feelings that you have. It's something that you've worked on so hard and you just have to question if it's going to happen and what the implications are if it does not happen. And eventually we started talking to the chamber. We started talking to the downtown business owners and they started encouraging us even more as, hey, this project needs to happen. We have to find a way to get these costs. So, um, you know, we started having these meetings on a Thursday or a Friday and the entire weekend. Um, we were working with, the, again, the city manager at the time, Ryan Waller, our previous finance director, Andy Lent. And we're trying to find buckets of money that we can use for this project and trying to get creative on how we can come up with funding. And, you know, ultimately we found ways forward for the project. Um, the council was on board with doing that. Um, the square business owners mostly were on board with doing that. Uh, we did get some pushback from the community in general. That's typically going to happen with a project um, that is this expensive. But I think ultimately um, you, you look outside on the square. I know some people don't like it, but I think a lot of people do like it. And again, like I said before, I think it's going to pay off uh, just dividends in the future. And for the square, we're in kind of the final phases of the construction and everything should be completed. I think I got an email from you the other day, Charlie, about, hey, you know, in the next community update, let's share this status update yep. because uh, IMU will be back over there in that West Alley um, beginning uh, here next week. So how cool is it? And when you look back and just that journey of how far you and the city have come to get to the point where we're at soon to yep. then kind of wrap it up and be able to celebrate and have the square be fully um, utilized for any and all purposes. Yes. So um, we're in this weird 
portion of weather right now here in February where I don't think we had too many days under freezing. And so everybody's, we're, we're looking at it, we're excited. It's like, hey, can we get started right now on these projects? But at the same time, everybody's like, hold on, it's Iowa. Like, we're going to have another winter event of some sort. Like, it's just, it, statistics will tell you what's going to happen uh, at some point here in the next month or so. So let's just be a little cautious on this. So we've, we've been talking about this. We have development review meetings uh, biweekly um, with uh, our uh, kind of, development review team uh, within the city and you know every meeting that we have we're progressively getting closer to that point of yeah I think we're going to start moving forward with this so 100% what's happening here um, soon at the the beginning of March is that IMU still has a little bit of work in our West Alley to do so this this project's been a great collaboration between the city and IMU Um, you know if you go in the alleys of the square we've got overhead electrical lines all over the place and IMU has had a goal of of undergrounding electrical lines for some time. So we were able to work with them knowing that we were going to be redoing some of these alleys and get those lines underground. So step one for them is they put conduit in the ground. Um, so then we can put, again, the alley, the paving back on top of it. Uh, and they've got a little bit of work left to do in the West Alley. So for the next couple of months, they're going to be kind of finishing up their portion of that. So then when they're ready to pull electrical lines underground through that conduit, um, they're ready to go. Uh, once they're completed, then our contractor will get back in there. And actually, at this point, really all we have left to do is to um, pave the parking lot and pave the alley and we'll be done. So we're kind of hopeful that the project should be wrapped up by the end of this fiscal year for city. That's June 30th. Um, so by July 1, we're pretty much done with this project. We were hopeful when the project started that we would have been done uh, by last fall. Um, but, you know, every project has its delays. We're we're working with so many different entities on this project. It's not just the city. It's the city. It's IMU. It's every franchise utility that's in the alley. You know, Mid American on gas, CenturyLink on fiber, Medi- or, uh, MediaCom, and all that. Just stuff. So many moving. Oh parts. my God! It, it and you can't keep up with it. Sometime and you know. And again, when you're when you're in a square that is just as old as the square, you know, you take off the concrete and all of a sudden you start finding things that if you had X-ray vision, you'd be seeing them. Uh, but until you take that lid off the ground, you don't know uh, a lot of things that are down there. And it's just a fact finding mission and trying to figure out who owns these things, who's responsible for these things. Um, and that overall will cause delays. Kind of switching gears here, but you talk about, you know, with how historic our downtown square is, a lot of work has been happening as of late in terms of the downtown facade grant program. Um, just tell us a little bit more about that program and that first round and to where um, kind of the the phase that we're currently at and then just the impact that that program has provided to uh, the square collectively and for the business owners who've been able to take advantage of it. So we started um, looking at facade improvement grant opportunities for uh, the downtown businesses and property owners. Um, I guess that would have been 2022. We just started out with um, just interviewing business owners and seeing what areas of concerns that they did have with their buildings. They had concerns with their windows, their doors, um, accessibility into the building, parts falling off. So we were able to uh, look at those concerns that they had and then formulate a grant opportunity that really fit what the need was in the community. We did a series of visual sessions with the Downtown Square Commission, just looking at what their priorities were in terms of the aesthetics in the downtown area too. And um, that with the input from uh, downtown businesses, we created the Downtown Facade and Interior Improvement Program. Um, And we just pushed that out um, and allowed businesses to apply for them based off of their needs, um, whether that was interior or um, on the outside facade areas. When we did do those interviews, we did recognize that there was a bigger need than what we would be able to offer from the city. So we did also look at um, applying for the uh, CDBG uh, downtown revitalization grant to but yeah, it's been great. We've gotten good response responses from the downtown businesses so far. Um, I think when we had uh, put out the first grant, we had around 20 uh, downtown businesses, property owners apply for it. So that was good. And for some of those businesses who were fortunate to have been approved um, for that first round of the uh, of the grant program, 
the majority of them are now all completed with their renovations, and except with maybe a, a one or two. Is that correct? Yeah, we had six total recipients on that, um, and I think four of them have been completed. One is going to be completed here in the spring when well, when weather allows. I think we're there, but uh, hopefully here pretty soon. And then one of them is no longer going to happen on that initial round just because it is kind of being wrapped into one of the bigger projects on that CDBG grant. So I think in total we had, um, was it, a, we, we fund, well, we had $125,000 worth of funding that we were going to hand out. I think in the end we're going to hand out 110000 of that, but I believe that triggered about $250,000 worth of reinvestment into the square. So, you know, the city was about, what, about a 45% uh, stake in that reinvestment, which was really good. Now, when we look at the CDBG grant, um, that one's much bigger. So that's going to have about a $1.3 million mark on the square. So $1.3 million worth of reinvestment in the square. And the city is only responsible uh, for funding $345,000 worth of that. So that's about 25% of the total thing. So what's really good about that CDBG grant is we actually get 50% of federal dollars coming in and then the city puts up 25% and the property owners put up 25% to get that total. So um, it, it's a really good opportunity for us. Um, we did apply for that back in November. I think it was right before Thanksgiving. Um, we initially did get feedback that our application had some deficiencies that we had to work through. So we've been given an extension on that deadline uh, to fix some of those deficiencies. But I think our team, um, we're, we're using an architect, Curtis Architect, and then we're using the Mid-Iowa Planning Alliance uh, to help us through that process. So it's a good team effort that we have going there. But our team, um, the other team members have worked on these projects in the past and they're pretty confident that ours is going to be a successful application with these revisions that we do. Um, and then we're just probably going to continue to see more reinvestment in the square yet again this year on some buildings. I think in total the CDBG one has five different buildings it impacts. So the CBG is a little bit different. It looks at facade sides. I think in total we have about seven or eight different facades that we're working on. But um, for the layperson, it's about five properties that are going to see some transformation. That project's really focused on the southeast side of the square mainly. Uh, but the good thing is this application cycle, um, the way it works, it's a two-year application cycle from the time you apply to the time you get funding and the projects happen. Um, I think our intention from staff standpoint, as long as we continue to get funding for it, would be to work around the square and give everybody an opportunity who wants to do it. Because like Emily said, that first round of applications, we had 20 people who were interested, 20 people who submitted applications. Um, and with this CDBG round, uh, we have even more people who are really, really chomping at the bit uh, to get some facade improvements down. So going back to the downtown project and the courthouse, that was one thing that we always visioned when we were doing this was the courthouse was going to go in brand new courthouse the city was going to take care of our streets and kind of improve the area around there we were always hopeful eventually the business owners then would take care of their properties and that was part of the reason that we did the 2023 grant program um, thankfully we found uh, a grant program through the state uh, using federal funding that can help with that even more but you know, it's something that I think in 10 years, um, if for anybody who, uh, for anybody who hasn't been in Indianola, if you came today and then you came back again in 10 years, you're just going to see a, a great transformation on our square. Oh, for sure. And you talk about too, in terms of, um, you know, the percentage of money that's come from the city, from, uh, from federal government, from business owners, you know, when I talked with at least one business owner who took advantage of that, of that first program, if it weren't for this program, they wouldn't have been able to update their buildings. So you talk about that collaborative effort to change a business and change a area, change a community. I mean, what a phenomenal way to make an immediate and long-term impact. I know when we were doing this, we had council members asking for this information was because the city had previously done facade grant programs. They were a little bit different than, than how we did them this time around. And I know, Emily, you did some pretty good research on just those properties that the city did invest in, how the taxable value increased on those properties compared to properties that didn't do any uh, investment in there. So, you know, we were able to show the council that, hey, if, if you do invest and you do put the monies into this, you know, it's not going to pay off tomorrow, but in 10 years, 15 years from now, um, you'll have a return on your investment. 
when you've done research, do you look at other downtown squares and how they are kind of improving their buildings or what kind of research, Emily, did you do to bring that, that back to Indianola? I would say that the first part of the research was just seeing with our downtown businesses and property owners what their needs were. Um, but then on the other half, yeah, looking at what other downtowns um, within Iowa were doing. So Knoxville, um, they've actually gone through a couple CDBG grant programs. Um, so that's where we kind of both looked at that and said, well, we, we could work around the square then in that instance and have that investment really maximize the um, impact on city investment and private property um, owner investments as well. Um, but no, when we're looking at the research, I think uh, we had seen like a 40% increase on mm-hmm. uh, taxable value for wow. uh, the downtown properties that we did invest. So when you talk about uh, peeling like layers away from buildings, I mean, there's, and with how historic our downtown square is, there's some still original brick. There's still a lot of like, I'm going to call it rich traditions that are still intact in the majority of these buildings. How cool is that to still, and with one of the facades that are uh, hopefully still part of this second round with the CBDG grant program, um, there is still a lot of that original nature where even though you're talking about renovations and change, this program will still honor that legacy that uh, is that story of Indianola, just how cool is that to be able to transform something, but still honor your roots? I mean, even like the Harrison's building, for example, right now. Which is what I was referring to, but I wanted you guys to say it. (laughs) I mean, they have, I guess, the brick facade that's kind of considered as a slip cover, right? So um, that whole facade is actually covering a existing facade that's still intact, um, I guess, omitting the lower level, but on the upper level level, they still have, um, the original windows and the glasses maintained. Um, and you can see the old, uh, rooms that were inside on the upper level too. So it's interesting to see how, even though it's been like a hundred years or so that it's still there and it's still existing. So we'll wait till we divulge into more information into how, because we have to wait till we get, uh, approved for that that's going to be really cool for the community to see how this program and how it will still honor the tradition that this building that is kind of a an icon in indianola not just a square but in indianola to still kind of honor that legacy but that, very cool and that one in particular has been really really fun for us i said this when we presented those renderings to council it's it's one of the most exciting uh, concepts I've ever been a part of. Um, but you know, the, the funny thing is, is I will take that concept to people who have not seen it yet and I'll show them, I say, Hey, what building do you think this is on the square? And just try to get them to guess and nobody can guess what it is. And then when you tell them, they're like, Oh wow, that would be great. Um, but you know, the other thing it does too is, is these, these projects are going to hopefully help us also get some kind of that upper story, uh, activity taking place. I don't want to say upper story housing because it doesn't have to be limited to upper story housing, but some activities in some of these upper stories. I mean, I I can go around the square right now and I can think of probably four or five buildings where the upper story um, has absolutely nothing going on in it. It's just storage of some sort or, you know, there's there's just old boxes up there and things like that. And, and that's one good thing about our square is, you know, we want to kind of create it as that activity center. And if you can activate those spaces up there if you can put uh, you know a reception type venue up there or you can put three or four apartment buildings up there well that's now three or four people who are living on the square and are shopping around the square eating on the square visiting the square spending their time on the square if you're able to put some sort of reception venue up there well on a friday and saturday night you know that's potentially hundreds of people who are coming down to the square and and when that reception's over they're going to go out and they're going to do things around the square so it's just a great opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately for me, Aaron, you you grew up here. Um, so you maybe understand it a little bit better than I do. But, you know, I've been here for five years and I've seen more activity in the square in that five years. I don't know what it was like in the past or anything like that. Um, and it's not really fair for me to judge either because when I came here, there was no, the, the courthouse was still, the old courthouse was still standing in the middle of the square, but it was not operational. So that level of activity was not taking place there. So, you know, that's probably played into me seeing that increase of activity, but 
but um, historically, I don't know where we've been, but I just, I think um, we have a great square. We have a wonderful opportunity and we have great business, great business owners. Um, and everybody wants the same thing for the square. Some people have different ways to get there, but in the end, we all get to the same place. Yeah. It's almost like reimagining the future. And this is the perfect kind of mantra. And I don't know if you guys, you can, you can use that in your own department now because when I'm going to now is those plain unit developments. Uh, this is around the time when I came on board with the city when we're talking about Emerald Bay and Deer Run and Kentucky Ridge, and there's probably a handful of others that I'm leaving out, but um, we were all part of the five-hour-long Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Unfortunately. <laughs> but you talk about um, taking the next steps to to reimagine Indianola and these planning developments are kind of that in a nutshell. Just provide a little bit of context into what a PUD is and the process that it, it has to go through from a city standpoint. Really with a PUD, it's, it's an opportunity for a developer to create a master plan um, that ultimately would provide some flexibility of land use, development densities, and building locations that other traditional zoning districts probably would not allow. For example, you know, we have our straight residential, our straight commercial, and our straight industrial zoning districts. And in some of these instances, and I'll use both Emerald Bay and Deer Run, for example, we have a mix coming in here. We're going to have some commercial. We're going to have some multifamily. We're going to have some duplexes, some townhomes, some single family. Same thing with Emerald Bay. And, you know, you could get to the nuts and bolts of, okay, well, let's identify what those areas are and we'll put the R1 zoning district on this area, the R2 zoning district on this area, the R3 on this area, the C2 on this area. Um, and it gets really complex and it's just a, you know, a broad array of colors that show up on a zoning map. And or you could just do these PUDs and, and it allows for kind of these mixes of uses under certain scenarios. And that's really where I think we've used it um, pretty well. Um, and let's let's develop a master plan for these areas, what we want them to look like, how we want them to operate, um, you know, how we're going to get uh, amenities in there, parks, things like that. Um, let's have those reviewed and approved and, and, and we'll go on it. So um, obviously with both of those, there is a process that is involved and the public should and is heavily involved in those process because our job in the community development department as planners, uh, both planners by trait, is to make sure that we are balancing the land use rights of private property owners with the desires of the community, essentially, and the desires of those neighboring property owners. Um, so their input is important to us. Sometimes people will tell you, ah, you know, you'll hear our input and it goes in one ear and out the other. And then that's not true. That's not true at the council level. That's not true at the commission level. That's not true at our level. Um, we hear everything that is being said. Sometimes we might not do what they're asking us to do, but we hear it and we do take it into account. So yeah, it's 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 just been an amazing process. You know, you talk about the five hour meeting. I know I just kind of joked about it and said, unfortunately, um, you know, if I had those meetings every single week, that would be one thing. But when you have them from time to time, they actually can kind of be a little bit fun uh, to have because it really kind of shows what you're doing is important um, and that people are paying attention. And it just kind of reminds you that, you know, you need to make sure that you're doing what's right for the community. We talked about this with the mayor on the last, uh, the fir actual first episode of Indie Unplugged. And I kept saying that that was civic engagement at its finest. I mean, that's the way the process should be. I mean, I would love if we have dozens of people filling our council chambers for every single mm -hmm. meeting because they are uh, paying attention. They are part of the process and they are a valuable key player to everything that we do as a city. How, how quick, though, can people be to assess or judge a PUD? Because if it, it, it can always be something where it's... Uh, if you see on that map and all these different colors and, hey, I'm that color, hey, that's my property, hey, this is an immediate change to what I'm having right now, how do you kind of reassure people we are very a long ways away from what this will actually look like? Be part of the process in terms of uh, voicing your opinions, whether you're in support or against of, and here's how you can continue to be engaged and, and get the facts and, and, and be part of this journey that we're taking together. You know, I, I think, yeah, people sometimes can be a little bit quick to judge. Um, and, and, you know, I think of the deer run in the Emerald Bay. 
uh, really good example is everybody thinks multifamily and then they look at the existing multifamily that we have in this community and they go, oh my gosh, that's what it's going to look like. I don't want that there. The good thing with us is we updated our zoning codes back in 2021 and we have, I don't want to say strict design standards, but we have design standards that we require for those buildings that we did not have when the previous ones were built. So, um, you know, we can thankfully tell the community that, yeah, you know, I, I understand you're, you, you're very curious on how this is going to look, but hey, we do have codes in place that are going to make sure that they, they look good, um, that they're not going to be um, just basic materials, you know, steel siding, vinyl siding, whatever that is. No, they've got to have some other components built into that. So, um, you know, we make sure of that. And, and I think it's, as through those discussions, you know, I think people maybe get a little bit more comfortable with things um, and and they're able to kind of come to terms um, with the future on, on those pieces of ground. And even with all the information that we have available for stakeholders and, and, and folks to be able to follow on with, the, with, the, uh, with projects and PUDs, I mean, Emily, you especially in the past year have kind of revamped the community development website and the assets that are available to be more transparent and forthright in terms of providing the information for anyone, any user to learn more about these projects and status updates and just kind of the steps that the city is taking on any given project. We launched, I guess it's been a year now, um, our current development projects map. um, Which is also the most clicked item in every single community update. It was, I mean, it was obviously also in the top of your guys' analytics for a department. So it's mm-hmm. always, it's always a, a, a hot uh, digital item for sure. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you say that too, because before we even launched it and made it public and started doing social media posts on it, like I, I hadn't even shared it with anyone except for Charlie. And I had maybe like 40, 50 views, <laughs> like a day. <laughs> like, which they it they was might very... have all been me too, because I was pretty excited about it. So it was... But, but no, um, it, it's been a great tool um, to be able to like share out and help people visualize what um, current development, it might look like in our community um, and really increase that engagement for our uh, development projects that we're seeing. We do send out notifications for some of our development projects but obviously those won't be as detailed as actually seeing what it could look like or what the architectural renderings look like so it's been a great tool yeah no for sure and i appreciate it too because it's just it's it's a great way again you go back to transparency and communication it's how we're able to put the information to the public to again like you said be engaged and be informed with everything that's happening in their community. As you talk about more of other projects and studies that the city is putting on, you know, right now we're still taking input for the housing study and needs assessment. Talk a little bit about kind of that process and to um, kind of what we're seeking to accomplish as a city with this particular study. The housing study is is great. So again, I go back to when we're talking about the comprehensive plan and all the implementation strategies that are within our comprehensive plan. One of those implementation strategies is, hey, you need to look at a housing study. So going back to 2020 when we did our comprehensive plan, um, one of the things that the school district actually asked the city for was, hey, look at a housing study because we need to better understand as a school district you know, kind of what our growth is going to be, where our needs are, and because the school district has, you know, they're, they're their own entity. They have a lot of planning that goes on based off projections, right? Like, because that's really where their focus is, is where we're going to be at in the future. Um, so again, a great collaboration that we had with the school district on that one. Um, unfortunately, I think when we did it, the we did it as kind of like a bid alternate, essentially, which means that, hey, we want the comprehensive plan done. But here's two other things that we'd also like done as part of the comprehensive plan. So give us some pricing on that. Um, we just, at, at the time, we couldn't afford it because we didn't have um, enough money earmarked to do the comprehensive plan. But we did get uh, a kind of um, a more simple version of a housing study that was done as part of the comprehensive plan. And because of that, we put that implementation strategy into the comprehensive plan that said, hey, you need to do a full-on housing study. Now, when we talk about all the developments that are happening, um, one of the ones in particular that we're working on right now is the schoolyard development. Um, that is the old trailer park uh, that is just east of the high school 
right there on 15th and 92. Uh, it's been a vacant piece of ground. Um, another thing in the five years that I've been here, that's something that we've constantly been trying to get redeveloped. And we have a great opportunity here with a developer who's working with some workforce housing credits uh, through the Iowa Finance Authority. And one of the requirements that they have on that is that they need an updated housing study with the city. Um, so in working with them, knowing what our comprehensive plan said and knowing we did have some capacity within our budget uh, for another study this year, we thought, hey, what's a better time than now? We can assure that this development happens out here. We can check mark or check off another item on the implementation strategy. And again, we've got the money sitting here to be able to do it. Um, but it's really, really, really important for us. And it's really important for a lot of the people in the community to really understand where our housing needs are. You know, we can continue to get development inquiries for single family developments, um, you know, with a price range on a house from, you know, 300 to $500,000. Um, but what we need to know and, and we need the data to show is, is that really what we need or are we saturated with that level of development? That's not to say that we're going to use this study to tell people, no, we don't want this development anymore. But it gives us a tool to then go out and start looking and, and working with other developers developers to say, hey, we need the level of housing that is, you know, X amount of dollars, whether it's, you know, that two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar range or if it's even five hundred thousand plus. We're deficient in those areas. We have a demand in those areas and we need to look at that. It also helps, you know, back up some of the multifamily developments that we're having. Um, I don't think it'll be a secret that our housing study is probably going to show that we need more multifamily because that is becoming a bigger thing nationwide statewide, um, wherever that might be, people are getting more interested in multifamily developments. That's a good thing. We just need to make sure that we're responding to those demands and we're putting our resources and our efforts on recruiting developers. I'll just use the word uh, term recruiting, but you know, recruiting developers and talking to developers and encouraging the level of development that our city really needs. So when you had those conversations with developers, kind of what are the, the pitches, so to speak, that you, when you were trying to recruit them, what do you, what do you say? You've got to sell in Yanola, and, and honestly, it's not that difficult for me. Um, the the biggest thing that we have working against us is just our sheer distance from the metro, but it's really not that far. And I think um, when you look at a lot of people in the metro, one thing that I've always had to kind of laugh at when it happens is people think Indianola is further away from the metro area than it actually is. There's a few things that we can look at when we're comparing ourselves to our peers in the metro. First of all, we're closer to the airport than probably 75% of the cities in the Des Moines metro area, which is really nice. Um, that helps with industrial development and stuff like that. Um, but just being able to sell the things that we have here in this community. I'm talking, we talk the square, we talk Simpson College, um, we talk the National Bloom Classic, the Des Moines Metro Opera, the Warren County Fair. There is just so many things happening in this community um, that people, when when they come down here and they realize it, I think they really think Indianola is a very nice place. So what we're trying to do is we're just trying to sell processes um, and amenities to these developers and making them realize that it's good. But from my standpoint, honestly, it's 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 constant communication too. You just have to keep communicating with these people um, and making sure that Indianola is on the top of their mind and and you know making them aware of opportunities when they come along. You know, if a piece of ground comes up for sale, um, they might not see it on a on the MLS uh, listing for three or four days after it comes on there. But if I'm able to give it to them three days ahead of time, you know, maybe that makes a difference in in some timing on that. So. Um, it's knowing what they want. It's knowing what we need. Um, it's knowing what we have to offer um, from, you know, financial resources as well, too, on, on residential development. It's not that much, uh, but what little we have, we can really um, we can really promote to those developers. With the housing study, I mean, at this point in time, the community can still participate in the survey and all that information can be found on uh, the city's website, www.indianolaiowa.gov. If you were to go through the Community Development Department page, um, there's a section there, I believe, right, Emily, where they can click to and then be able to find the housing study um, link to that as well. Otherwise, I think the direct link to the website of the study website is engage.thinkconfluence.com backslash Indianola dash housing dash study. Don't ask me how I remember memorize that, but I do memorize that because of, of, of a bunch of different communications we put out to get more of our 
uh, citizens and, and residents and, and community members to participate in that survey because your input is valuable. And I think so far right now, when I was looking at the data that Confluence had provided, it was around roughly like what, 150, 180 submissions thus far. But we want more. We have plenty more people in this community that uh, need to voice their opinion and be part of the process because it's shaping the future. Uh, up until like 2050, I think I've seen some of the <laughs> the the years we've been putting on our communications. Right? Yeah, you're spot on too. And and you know we we've kind of been communicating via email this morning amongst all of us with our consultant on this too, and just hey, the survey's out here. We haven't really picked a date to end the survey yet, and we're really trying to get that. Um, So anybody who's listening right now, take the survey, tell your friends to take the survey, send it to your friends, your your family, whoever it may be. Because again, what we're doing here is we're really trying to get that community input um, to shape our future. And every little bit of engagement that we get helps us get to that point to make sure that we are doing what you as a community wants us to be doing. So as we wrap up this podcast, which I think I might have you guys on in the near future because we could definitely do like a multi-parter because there's so much that we can dig into and it's almost overwhelming do you ever feel like in your day-to-day jobs you feel overwhelmed i've seen some nods how, how do you how do you navigate all this knowledge and all of the the moving parts to the various things that your department does day in and day out Teamwork, uh, from our standpoint, I mean, we've got a great staff. We're small but mighty, um, and, and that's not just my department. That is every department within the city as a whole. We rely heavily on our experts across the city. So, you know, we're, we're looking at Jared from the sewer department. We're looking with uh, Mike, Justin, and Kurt at IMU, and we're working with Akilish Powell to, to look at the streets and all that stuff. We have got so many people who are experts in their fields, really good at what they do, and give us feedback on these projects so we can make sure that we are getting the best product for Indianola. Um, so that's really important. Um, you know, but I think for us too, it's it's just making sure that we have positive relationships, even amongst each other. You know, we're able to have fun. I think while we're at work, um, you know, we we all get along with each other, um, and and you know, it's just good to sometimes take a break from the day to day activities occasionally and make sure that we're having those um, discussions with each other and having those moments with each other. And you know, even even with you guys, Aaron and everybody else that comes along, just uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we do. I think as a city to make sure that our staff is mentally healthy uh, in that sense because it is really important because the day-to-day that we do I mean I I I I I know I work quite a bit um, sometimes past five o'clock and and we have night meetings it seems like at least one night meeting a week if not sometimes two a week um, that we have to take care of and that takes us away from our personal lives Um, but again it it is it is it is a big time commitment uh, at times and there is sometimes where you feel like you are just not getting all of the work done. Um, but thankfully, again, our team is is good. We're we're making sure that we help each other out. Um, and you know, if something needs to be done, we'll get it done. And if something can possibly wait a little bit more to get done, uh, we're just making sure that we get those right things in place. How do you navigate it, Emily? I would go back to like what Charlie said. Like I, I really do rely on my coworkers, and sometimes like I do forget things. And when Charlie reminds me like, oh, how is this thing going? Like that really mm-hmm. helps me make sure that I'm doing my follow-ups with um, developers or um, other coworkers that are doing uh, reviews on the same development plans if we need anything on that. Um, but then also really just maximizing our use of technology too, because now we do our development review team uh, reviews all on Teams rather than emails. And that kind of helps us put off like the the amount of organizing of emails that we had to do mm-hmm. in the past. So that that has helped a lot. And we use like the task function and everything. So yeah, it's, and it's a great point too. just the technology advancements that I think our department has made, even our city has made um, that are just more user friendly, even our permitting, our rental registration, our code enforcement process is all online right now. Um, and, and it's just it, it becomes somewhat automated for us, which is really helpful because you know, rather than what we were doing a long time ago was we were tracking everything in Excel spreadsheets. And it's just it takes time for our staff to go in and update the Excel spreadsheet and make sure that we're doing this and update this. And, and we now don't have to worry about that because it is all automated. 
allows us, it gives us some more time to then be more diligent in other areas, which is really nice. And just more efficient from both an internal standpoint and external um, for the end user of being able to submit those uh, permit applications or, um, you know, whatever the case may be. Efficiency is key. And I'm definitely trying to be efficient as a communications manager for the city. And such a well-rounded team we have from, you know, all of our various departments to all of our various staff levels. I mean, we all love this community. We all want to be part of this community. It's so great to be part of this team and part of this mission. We definitely appreciate everybody. Everybody's got a unique job um, that makes the city function um, from council down to just staff. And uh, we all do a great job. We all enjoy doing it. And we do it because we love this city. Before we wrap up, is there anything at all that either of you want to share? The only thing I can, you know, again, there's so many things that we always have and so many notifications that we have to get out to people. Um, You know, it's it's pay attention to our social media page. Just pay attention to our website. Go and sign up for our notifications, the news flashes, the agendas and stuff like that. Um, You know, I think sometimes we'll, we'll get into these. Um, situations where people are like, well, I didn't know that was happening, but it's like the information is there. You know, we can't necessarily send out a piece of mail to everybody in the community every time something happens. We can't necessarily go knocking on everybody's door and letting them know that something's going to happen. The information's there. There are ways to make sure that you're getting the information. Um, So please do that. And if you need help doing that, reach out to really anybody at the city, because I think we all know how to get that set up. Yeah. And various ways. I mean, in terms of this podcast, in terms of our website, social media, print, I mean, we work hand in hand with the media as allies to help share the information, whether, whether it's a, an emergency or general reminders. I mean, we try to meet people where they are in various different formats to share this information in an accessible, easy to digest manner. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Indie Unplugged. Make sure that you hit that subscribe button if you haven't already subscribed to the show. And you know what? Go ahead and also leave us a review. Rate this podcast. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. Again, we're in the beginning stages of implementing this communication strategy into our workflow. So again, be part of that process. Help us reshape what this could look like. And who knows, maybe someday you'll be a future guest of Indie Unplugged.